Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. My friend Sean Moore sent me a YouTube video of Bruxy Kevy teaching on the separation of church and state. And this isn't a teaching that most people understand as the separation of church and state that we know in the mainstream as separation of church and state. He's talking actually about being separate from the state. And for those that are familiar with the Bad Roman Project, our main focus, or when we first started this, and we kind of divert from it a little bit, but our main focus is the growing entanglement of the Christian with the state. And so I reached out to Bruxy to see if he would be interested in coming on the show and chatting about this further. Would you rather serve God than serve Caesar, you know me? How are you doing today, Bruxy? Hey, I'm doing very good, Craig. It sounds like you've got a good thing going on with this podcast, and I'm I'm feeling um, really grateful that you invited me to be a part of it. So uh, before we get started, why don't you give us some background of yourself for those that may not be familiar with you? Because I, before I got this video, before this video was sent to me, I was, I was not familiar with you myself. Sure. Well, we are a couple of unlikely brothers. And that's what I love. I love when Jesus brings people together and reminds us that we're family when we have nothing else in common, right? We don't come from the same part of the world exactly. We're both in North America. We don't necessarily come from the same neighborhood or the same culture, but we 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 are pulled together by this whole Jesus movement, and that makes us family, and I love that. So I'm, I'm a Canadian uh, in the Toronto, Ontario area, which is kind of in the middle, uh, just uh, above New York, and we... I'm the pastor of a church called The Meeting House. If people want to know more, they can go to TheMeetingHouse.com. The Meeting House comes from an Anabaptist background. Um, so I, I grew up evangelical proper. Uh, I have both Pentecostalism and, and Baptist, kind of conservative Baptist, kind of the John MacArthur kind of conservative Baptist in my background. I was a pastor uh, for a number of years. And, and then at some point in my life, things started to unravel a little bit. Just theologically, I was asking too many questions. I just had a brain that wouldn't shut up. It's, it's called, I learned later, a reflective mind, which is a mind that is constantly asking questions. And I thought maybe there's something wrong with me, but I learned that this can be used for good. If you, we're, we're just always wanting to kind of pry beneath the surface and figure things out a little bit more. And so as someone with a reflective mind, I mean, it's busy in my brain. I was just always asking questions. And after a while, I realized that just some of the standard evangelical approach to life that I had been raised with and I had been had learned in seminary, it wasn't holding up under scrutiny just as I studied the way of Jesus more and the history of the church. I had more and more questions. And, um, and it was around that time I stumbled onto this Anabaptist movement, which I think has a lot in common with uh, Christian anarchy. And um, here you have a movement that happens on the heels of the Protestant Reformation. So you have the Protestant Reformation where the Protestants protest uh, the Catholic churches and the abuses of the church. And they kind of put scripture in the center, sola scriptura. And on the heels of that, what a lot of people don't know is just within a few years of the Protestant Reformation, you have what's called the Radical Reformation. And the radicals were the students of the Protestants who said, thank you for getting us to fall in love with the Bible. But now as we read the Bible, we realize Jesus is at the center. And the radicals challenged the Protestants to say, you need to go one step further and not just put the Bible in the middle of our faith, but put Jesus in the middle of the Bible that's in the middle of our faith. And when you do that, everything changes. And so they became known as Anabaptists or the radical reformers ever since the 1500s. And I stumbled onto them about uh, this time in my life when I was questioning so many things about my evangelical background, appreciating lots. I mean, really grateful for so much from my Pentecostal and my Baptist background, but there was just something more. So I stumbled onto it and ended up uh, becoming a pastor of an Anabaptist church. Um, and, um, and the meeting house is something that, I mean, I get to be the pastor of it, but it's the kind of church that I would want to be a part of. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd still want to attend. So I'm continually learning and growing and happy to share with you a little bit of my own journey and what I've been learning 
in this conversation. That's great. And I told you, I, I spent a lot of time in Southern Baptist churches. My dad is a Church of Christ preacher. And in these Southern Baptist churches, uh, there was a guy that showed up. He would show up from time to time, and he was he was an Anabaptist. And at the time, what he would what he would talk to me about the Anabaptists teach, you know, no war. You know, we're teaching peace, and it was all foreign to me because in a Southern Baptist church, we would have uh, ceremonies to the military, we would have uh, United States flags on the stage, and it all just seemed really normal to me. That's the way. This is the way it was. We were. Well, we're a Christian nation, right? So we're supposed to be part of this. Uh, we're supposed to support the state, and it just never really occurred to me that that was that that's not what Jesus was teaching us. And the things that this guy was that was telling me as an Anabaptist, I was like, "Man, I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I if I if I agree with this or not." But the more I've studied my faith and how it aligns with anarchism or vice versa, the things that that guy told me in the past. It's, it's coming back to me. I was like, all right, so I, now I'm, I'm starting to understand what the Anabaptists are teaching. And, and it makes a lot more sense that the Anabaptist teaching aligns a lot with Christian anarchy, from what I can tell. And, and I think it's pretty cool. Now, I live in Memphis. There's not a, an Anabaptist church here in Memphis, but there's one, I think, in Mississippi that's maybe 20 or 30 minutes away that I haven't had a chance to visit yet. But I'm I'm hoping once we slow down at work that I'll be get, get a chance to go go check them out and Learn a little bit more. Well, in the meantime, Craig, we'll adopt you as extended family of uh, the Meeting House. That's awesome. I mean, uh, I was going to tell you, you're the first person that I've interviewed that's uh, not within the United States borders. <laughs> you're, right. you're you're the first one outside of the United States, so this is pretty cool. All right, I make your podcast international. That's beautiful. There you go. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's get into this. In this video, you talked about the separation of the church and state. You get into Romans 12 and 13, and as a uh, Christian anarch is one portion of scripture in this in Romans 13. And I, and I, I did in the past, but it's, it's a, it's a portion of scripture that Christians really wrestle with and that they don't understand the meaning behind it or the, uh, the context going along with it, or they leave out, like you said, in this video that, that was sent to me, they read Romans 13 without reading, reading Romans 12. There you go. And I love how you described us in this video as tourists. What did you say? You said we are a a Christian long before and long after we are a, a citizen of any nation. Yeah. So we are ambassadors. That's the New Testament identity sent by our true kingdom or our true nation, which is the Jesus nation. That's our citizenship. And we are not only citizens of the Jesus nation, we are ambassadors on behalf of the Jesus nation to whatever country we find ourselves in. So if most of your listeners are American, you are American from an earthly vantage point. But from the ultimate vantage point of God, you're not American. You are ambassadors to America on behalf of a different king. And so an ambassador has to get to know the policies of the nation they represent, the policies of their king. You need to get to know the will and the ways of Jesus really well, because you represent Jesus then to the nation that you've been sent to. And you also need to know the policies and the culture of the nation that you're sent to. So you need to know where America stands and what America is all about. But but you're not American first and foremost. You're you're a, a representative of Jesus to America. And that really changes the, our paradigm. You also talk about top-down legislation. That's what the state does. Don't worry about what the state does. That's what the state does. As Christians, we are here to serve one another. And it's contrary to what the state does. I mean, the state is not serving us. And it was one thing that I thought was funny because you, when you're teaching, you, you're, you, you have a lot of energy. <laughs> and you were talking about, you know, can we take off our state hat and do Christian stuff and then put our Christian hat back on? I guess I'm wording it wrong. I don't have the video playing, but uh, how do you reconcile the two? Right, right. If you were an ambassador to, say, France, and you were representing America to France, while you were in France, you would be representing American policy and educating people on what if, if that's your job. But you wouldn't be there trying to uh, change France. That's not your job. You're not even a citizen of France. And if France happened to go to war while you were there as an ambassador – you wouldn't be signing up for the military because you're you're not um, you're not French. You, you don't get involved in the state's affairs as a citizen of that country. 
you are representing, you're an ambassador representing a different country. And that should be our relationship with, with America, with Canada as Christians. Um, and so sometimes in the history of the church, Christians have read scripture as though we get to swap hats. We have our Jesus nation hat on, but then we can take that off and put on our God bless America hat and be full fledged Americana and get involved in things as an American citizen, but then take that hat off sometimes and put our Christian hat back on. But we never, we never get to take off our Jesus nation hat. We, we never retire from that job. We, we don't go back and forth. And so when we establish first and foremost, our primary allegiance to Jesus and his nation and his kingship, then we ask the question, now what, what am I called to do? And it all grows out of that identity. We don't wear two hats. Right. And I think that's it's one thing I've noticed when discussing uh, Romans 13, when when they, they use it to justify being involved with man-made government. Yeah, well, I, if, I don't know if you want me to address that. And Romans 13 is one of those passages that is, um, it's a go-to passage for people who want to wear two hats. And, um, and we have to remember that there's the chapter divisions or something they're added in later. So the Apostle Paul's thought starts flowing on this topic in Romans 12. And in essence, Romans 13 becomes an answer to a question that he raises in Romans 12. So Romans 13, start there and then work backwards. Romans 13 says we should be subject or submitted to the government. It's interesting. Paul has a number of different Greek words open to him that he could use, and he never uses the word to obey. We don't always necessarily obey the government. Uh, but all right, he, he could have said that. He could have used the word obey, but he never does. He'll use that for following Jesus. We obey what Jesus says, but we are submitted to the government. Well, what does that mean? It, it means that we, when possible, we will obey when we can, when it doesn't contradict with the way of Jesus. But when it contradicts with the way of Jesus, we can submit to whatever punishment is coming our way or whatever consequence we're going to get. We submit to the government as authoritative, but not as that which we must obey. So, um, so I'm always wanting, want to honor our earthly government. I don't want to be just a cheeky monkey. You know, we don't want this movement just to become the movement for people who like to rebel period and disrespect authority. I always want to be respectful. I always want to be kind. I want to be considerate. The fruit of the spirit don't take a day off in our lives. At least they shouldn't. But I, there will come a time where I say, listen, I'll submit to whatever consequences you have to give me but I am not going to obey that order or that command or that law or that rule. And so Paul says, submit. Yes. And now this, this raises a question. Well, how, how much should I submit? How much should I obey? Where do I draw the line? And I like how in verse six, um, he says, well, pay your taxes. That's it. Um, It always comes down to that actually in any conversation about this is you you say, well, you know, if I, if I support the government in any way, I'm supporting some of their misdeeds and their and war and other things. And it's true in a fallen world, every decision you make, every product you purchase, everything you do is going to somehow be attached to something evil somewhere down the line. And so Paul says, don't get involved in the things of the government. Do not get involved in the things of government. Um, and that might lead someone to say, well, then should we just be completely anti-government and just, and he said, no, you got to pray for them. You submit, you honor them, and pay your taxes. That's it. Um, and all of that is a response to a question that's been raised in chapter 12. So if we just back up a little bit, chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says, you know, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone, as much as it depends on you. Do your best from your point of view. Verse 19 of chapter 12, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. God says, vengeance is mine. So he's telling the church, you're not to be a part of the ven- revenge process, which is what a part of what justice is. It's, it's payback. It's eye for eye, tooth for tooth. It's you kill someone, you go to jail. Uh, you steal something, you go to jail, or you pay a fine or whatever. And so he says, but you're not to take a part of that process. You're not to be part of that. Do not take revenge. Uh, do not. You're not an agent of God's wrath. He says, leave room for God's wrath. I will avenge. I will repay. So that's what he says in verse 19, which raises the question, well, God, is that only going to be on judgment day when we die? Or are you going to, are you going to bring about any justice here and now? And he goes, yeah, I am actually. I'm going to work through the state. I'm going to work through government. I'm going to bring about my vengeance or my justice or my payback through government. But you, he's already said this, are not to have any part of that. 
So Romans 13 is answering the question, do we have to wait till judgment day till God, you, till you do anything? Uh, and he says, no, no, I'll be working for justice through the government and through vengeance and through wrath through the government. But the church is not to have any part of that. And so by the time you get down to chapter 13, um, verse four, it says um, the one in authority, in other words, the government is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, you should be afraid for the rulers bear the sword, not for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to uh, literally the Greek says to be an avenger unto wrath. And he uses the same words there. The government will be the avenger unto wrath that he's just told the church in chapter 12, verse 19, that you are not to do. You're not to seek vengeance and not to participate in God's wrath. The very two words that tell the church you're not to participate in this, Romans 13 says, but the government will, but you're not to have any part of that. It, so it seems really clear these are parsed out, two different roles. God will work through the government and he'll work through the church, but members of the church shouldn't try and do the work of the government. Or work through the government. Yeah. Through, we're not to be the agents of God's wrath or vengeance. It's not our job. I want to back up just a little bit. When you when you, when you you mentioned that about the the word submit in Greek, and I've, I've, it's, I learned that here not too long ago about there's a difference between submit and obey when I use it in a Greek. And, and you compare that to Acts 5. Peter was clear in Acts 5, we were to obey God rather than man. And, in, and Paul says in Romans 13, we're to submit to the governing authorities. There's two different two different meanings behind this. And one of my favorite examples, if probably if, if it may be my favorite example with all of this closer to our time, was Rosa Parks on the bus. Mm. When mm. she was on the bus, the bus driver told her she was going to have to move. She refused to move. She was ignoring this unjust law. I mean, it's clearly an unjust law to make somebody sit somewhere on the basis on the, of their, the color of their skin. And he said, I will call the police if you do not get up and move. And she goes, you may, mm. but she didn't move. But once the police showed up, she did submit to governing authorities. There was no violence. Yeah. To me, that's a perfect example of what he's talking about in Romans 13. And you talk about paying taxes as anarchists and, uh, you know, on the libertarian side of it, we always have, use the phrase taxation is theft, which it really is when you get down to it, because if you didn't, you didn't, you know, we pay them, but it's more out of self-defense or like you say, submitting to government authorities, but it's not, uh, it's not something that we did willingly. It was, <laughs> it was done out of coercion more than anything. And, and in some sense, every act of submission is going to feel like compromise, right? It's going to feel like, I mean, uh, there, there would have been a side of Rosa Parks that you could have carried it to the, uh, absurd extreme of saying, if this is an unjust law, then the police who are coming to arrest me represent an unjust system. Therefore, I will fight against them and I will refuse to submit on any matter. And in fact, if they're using force to represent an unjust system, I'll use force to fight back against that unjust system. And therefore, and then you have civil war and then you have, and, and so it's possible to take any stance and say, if I, if I, um, Submit. It feels like compromise. It feels like, I'm, and it can feel that way with paying taxes. Like, well, when I pay my taxes, I'm supporting their unjust system and their unjust laws, and um, and that's why it actually comes down to that. And Paul says, "Here's here's what you do. I know, I know everything you do in relationship with the government is going to feel like you're supporting the wrong kingdom, um, but pay your taxes as a form of submission, and so they can't accuse you of just being selfish. They can't say you're just concocting this philosophy to get out of paying your taxes. You're just a selfish movement of people who who don't like authority. Or say, no, that's not it. We're happy to submit to authority and we're, we want to be uh, law-abiding to the point where the laws actually contradict our heavenly king. And so then when we do draw the line in the sand and we do take a stand and we refuse to obey, it's on a matter of principle and it's really clear. Hey folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page. And you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, and send us an email at the Bad Roman Podcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, 
and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. So getting ready for this episode, I, I was going through your website and, and reading some of your blog, and I came across a, an article you wrote called Kingdom versus Caliphate. And it was a, it's a pretty funny article because you, you talk about a guy uh, named Hank that you came across. And he, he sounds like reading what you, you had a Hank's top 10 list of what he was trying to explain to you. And by reading this, it sounds a lot like what I hear from a lot of Christians here in America. And to be honest with you, I was that same guy. I was Hank at one time, to be honest with you. So it was funny for me to read it. I was like, yeah, that sounds familiar. But uh, I'm not going to read all of Hank's top 10 list, but the first one, we, the United States, he wasn't sure about Canada. You have that in parentheses, <laughs> are a Christian nation. And as a Christian nation, we did, need to defend the freedom and liberty God has given us. Now, one thing about this, one thing that I've noticed about, and, and I'm afraid, that I'm, and I don't want it to come to this way, and I think if Christians just t- take a step back and look at what's going on right now with uh, with this COVID-19 and, and the way the government's reacting to it, I understand what Hank's saying is we need to defend the freedom and liberty God has given us. And I, I fully believe that Jesus, they created us with this liberty, so I take it very personally if, if the government is, is trying to take my liberty away from me. But... I see a lot of people ready to go to war with the, with the government. There's a lot of talk, and that's you know, and that's not what we're supposed to. We don't. We're not to resist with violence. And I think that it was something else you said in your video about pacifism. I've, I've, this is something I'm still learning as well. But pacifism is not. You're not being passive like you're just kind of sitting back. You're you're actively working towards peace. And I think that how we should deal with this as Christians, that what's going on right now, you're not don't fight back physically. You're right on. You're right on. So, yeah, that's a misunderstanding. You think that pacifism means to be passive. It comes from the same root as um, as to pacify, which is to actively bring peace to a situation by by an active something you do like a I don't know what you call a baby soother or a pacifier. Um but that that's the same root word to bring about peace and to soothe in some way. And so we're called to be active change agents. Absolutely. But for the follower of Jesus, the ends and the means are aligned. So if we want to achieve peace, we use peace as the methodology to achieve that ends. The ends and the means are aligned. We don't use violence to achieve peace we don't use hate or name calling to achieve respect and honor. We, we're always saying, what's the goal I'm aiming for? Then how does that inform my methodology? And we live it out. We live it out. Uh, and so that's going to change how we relate to the government and to people around us who disagree with us. Um, and so when people say, you know, but we're a Christian nation, we got to fight to defend that. I think that is a, it's a, misunderstanding that there's no such thing as a Christian nation. There are just Christians. There are Christian people. There are Christ-following people. And it's interesting. I mean, sometimes a nation's greatest weakness is its strength that has clouded their thinking. So there's a lot of beautiful strengths in America's history, granted. And some of those strengths have led people to just assume that America is kind of God's gift to the our lives, to the world, um, to the way of liberty. But even America was founded in rebellion, right? America was Britain at one point. And then they said, well, we're rebelling against that. There's an unjust king and it's taxation without representation. And so we're going to rebel against that. And so there was a violent rebellion. So now what happens if Arkansas decides now, well, we're going to rebel against the rest of the states because we don't like how President Trump is making us do. So we're going to violently rebel. You'd say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. That's that's wrong. You shouldn't as a state just leave the nation. You don't get to make that decision. But that's kind of what the states did. What's what America did in its inception, in its founding. Um, so with right or wrong, it doesn't matter. That's not our kingdom. I don't have to judge it as a good thing or as a bad thing. I can just say it's a thing. It's just a thing, because it, but it's not my thing. I'm because it's not my nation. I'm part of the Jesus nation. Well, there was something. Some, I heard somebody say something one time about you know if you when you when you rebel and even if you were uh, successful in overthrowing a government, there's still somebody standing there with a sword in their hand. Yeah, yeah. 
in the end, even if the, even if it's the winner, you know, whoever wins, there's still somebody standing there with the sword. So it's just a, you just continue the process. Well, I'm, I'm more interested in, in how Jesus approached things. It seemed to, it seems to, and in the end it's going to work out better, you know, because even in Hank's top 10 list, he's, he talks about, uh, I guess you're, you're just kind of paraphrasing some of the stuff he said in it, but, and I don't want to read them all because I want people to go to your blog and, and read this because it's, it's pretty funny. But he says, uh, in the New Testament, Jesus said he came to bring a sword. And in the last uh, in Revelation, where he talks about, uh, you tell him, when he, when he come back and the sword's coming out of his mouth, he doesn't have, physically have a sword coming out of his mouth. He's clearly talking about his word, his message. And his message was always peace. Serve one another. Oh, yeah. It's, it's so true. People who want to justify violence and propping up powers of the world will it's it, it's interesting to watch how desperately they will reach out for different passages of scripture. And that's one of them in revelation, you know, well, Jesus comes back with a sword. I mean, yeah, but he's waving it out of his mouth, which is just really bad fighting technique. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> sword, right? It's just, Hey, you, what are you doing, man? But no, the, that's right. The sword of the spirit is his word. And it says, yeah, but he's got a robe that's dipped in blood. That's like warrior language. I know it's dipped in blood before the battle even begins. Right? That's his blood. Yeah. He he conquers by shedding his blood, not by shedding other people's blood. And so this is an image of Jesus. He's all bloody before the battle's even begun. So it's a powerful apocalyptic imagery in the book of Rela- Revelation that says, God, I mean, that's that's Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek or the gentle is the is the same word in the fruit of the spirit for gentleness. Blessed are the meek or the gentle. They're in the hair at the earth. God's plan for world domination is through gentleness. You know, the way of peace. Completely opposite of the state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we can trust, well, God will work through the state. We'll trust him to do that. You know, when Jesus was arrested by Pilate and Pilate said, Don't, aren't you afraid of me? I got the power of life and death over you. And Jesus said, I'm not afraid because you wouldn't have this position if my father didn't let you. So, you know, do your worst. God will use it. So even with somebody terrible like Pilate in, in power, God can use it. Uh, I got faith for that, but I don't. I don't have, so I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to fear, but I don't have to clamor to be a part of Pilate's kingdom. It's just not my kingdom. Exactly. And, I, and, and, and like I said, I, this, you, you call it Hank's top 10 list. I could call it Craig's top 10 list. And now <laughs> I don't have the same views anymore, but before I let you go, I, I want to end on this. And w- at the end of this uh, kingdom versus caliphate article, you never told us how Hank responded to, to your uh, retort. I never, so you kind of left me hanging, and I'm really kind of curious to how Hank responded to, you, to what you came back with. And I don't want people to go read the blog so they can see what, what your response to him was. But what did Hank say when you were done? Now, you know what? Hank got to the point. And it was it was very fun-loving. We were having a great debate. We were both smiling and having a good time. But at Hank, at the end of it, he, he just got the giggles and ran out of words. And you have to know – this guy was obviously someone who was not used to running out of words. <laughs> um, <laughs> he just ran out of words and started laughing. And then he walked away. I mean, we, we said a hug and a goodbye and he walked away shaking his head and I could still hear him laughing. And I'm glad it ended. It ended, you know, with just, I think planting, I, I have a friend who says that um, what you want to do in a conversation like that is not dominate the other person into submission and in the process, shame them or embarrass them. You want to plant a pebble in their shoe as far as their thought life is concerned. You're planting a pebble in the middle of their, their shoe. So as they walk away, you know that you know when you're walking along and you got something in your shoe and you kind of shake it a bit and you wonder, do I need to stop, take off my shoe or can I keep walking? And you shake it a little <laughs> yes. bit more. And it's like the mental version of that. You know, I just gonna I just gotta shake this a little bit and figure out if uh, and so that's that's how it ended. And I was happy. That's great. I'm happy to let him uh, just continue to chew on that at his own pace. That's awesome. I should mention this this top 10 list you're talking about, this conversation. It's on my blog at bruxy.com. I know it's a weird name, but easy to remember. Uh, bruxy.com. But also that now has become a chapter. The kingdom and the caliphate has become a chapter in my book, Reunion. So if you type my funny name into Amazon, Bruxy Cavey, uh, you'll find uh, a couple of books that I've written there. And in the book Reunion, we have a chapter on this. We have a chapter on this in my other book too, The End of Religion. Both of them are um, on, you know, available through Amazon or you can order it through any bookstore. And, um, and this, they both books have a chapter on what we've been talking about today. 
you, you beat me to it. I was going to have you plug anything you wanted to, but you you got it. Okay. All right. Good, good. All right, buddy. I appreciate you spending some time talking to us. This was a lot of fun, and I, I'd like to do it again. Maybe I'll go grab one of your books, and I'll have you on. We can talk about your book, too. Hey, no, I'm happy. I feel like I made a new friend, so this is great. Thanks, Hank, for uh, – or Craig. Sorry, I'm calling you Hank. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's all right. No, thank Me you. and Hank probably would have got along back in the day as well. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you, Craig. I really do appreciate you kind of inviting me into your community here. For sure, for sure. We have, we're, I'm, this, this is going to be a great resource, I think, because, like I said, this is a subject that Christians wrestle with quite a bit, and I've talked to – Several of them that have told me that, and and that's the whole uh, design behind this project: is to get people thinking about what's actually going on in our world and how we're supposed to be responding to this state as, as Christians. So I really appreciate your time, sir. Good, more power to you, my friend. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it. If you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com.